morning, church. If you open up your bulletins to our call to worship, please, before we start our, our first song, our call to worship is taken from Psalm 96, verses 1 through 4 and 6. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is feared above all gods. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Please remain standing as we sing our first song, Awesome.
Could you guys hear me? I don't know about holding a mic. Oh, recording. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. So the word of the Lord says, But immediately Jesus spoke to them, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on water and came towards Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind stopped, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's son. Now may the Lord bless the hearers and the doers of his word. Now this is a very familiar pericope to many people in the church circle. So I'm going to tell you like I told the worship team. If you help me preach this, we won't be here long. But if I see dull looks... I'm going to think you're not getting it, and I'm going to slow down because I think it's really important that we get it. So how long we stay here is all up to you guys, all right? All right, thank you. Deal. Is it deal? Okay. All right. So just a little summary. Early in this chapter, Jesus finds out that his cousin, John the Baptist, has been beheaded, right? So he's going to go to a place of solitude, but he notices that the crowd needs him. So he decides to put his knees to the, to the back burner, and he goes to feed them. He heals them. And then he's like, you know what? I have to take time. I got to go to worship the Lord. So he sends the disciple, the disciples on their way. I'm going to do this every time. Hopefully that's not too distracting for you guys, all right? So he sends the disciples on his way, right? But he notices that the winds and the waters are starting to crash against the boat. So what he does is he leaves his time with the Lord and he goes to meet them. Now, I really don't know who this may be for, but I, I really feel led to say this. If there's sometimes in our life that the Lord will place us in particular situations, knowing that all we have is to depend on him. There's no other way that we can do anything, right? So he will tell us to go ahead of him, or he will put us in a situation, the boat, just so he can show you a different perspective of his character. Just think about that. Now, before, they've already been on the boat one time before. As a matter of fact, six chapters earlier than that. And the winds were crazy, but Jesus was asleep. So they saw his calm character. They've seen him heal people early in his ministry, but they've never seen this attribute of the Lord. So what I, I, what I want to ask you guys is while you've been in Israelite, what has God shown you differently about his character than he showed you in the States? I know there's something, don't know what it is, but that's what he's good at, all right? So that wasn't even, that wasn't even part of the message. That was just something a little free. But even when God shows us a different part, it, it's not easy to accept it, right? Sometimes it's scary because we've never experienced that, 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 uh, that experience with him. But it's the same thing that the disciples did. They literally freaked out when they saw this ghost-like figure walking on water. They thought that he was a ghost. So even though he was showing them something different, they were still terrified. But the scriptures then read, it said, But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So I said the title of the message was... Uh, now, what you're looking at, but if we had a subtitle, it'd just be simply Jesus-focused, okay? And the first step to being Jesus-focused is talking to him. It seems pretty simple, like, just, just to talk. When we're feeling him calling out to us to, to talk back. So, 1 Thessalonians tells us to rejoice always and, and to pray without ceasing, but that's not what's happening here. They're, they're not rejoicing. They're terrified, yet there is something in Peter that says, you know what, that voice might sound, it sounds a little familiar. I don't know what it is, but it sounds like Jesus, so I'm just going to talk back to see, to see what he says to me. And here's the other thing, guys. It wasn't this great act of faith that Jesus had, I mean, that Peter had. Matter of fact, he says, if it be you, 
if it's a conditional word, he didn't say, Lord, I know it's you. Call me to come. He said, Lord, if it is you. So if I had to say one dash B point of being Jesus focused is to try him. So talk, talk to the Lord, right? But, but also try him. I'm not saying tempt him. I'm saying try, just try God. Now, I wonder if Peter, this is not in the text, I wonder if Peter had goals and aspirations to walk on water. I mean, he was a fisherman. Like, did he ever think, like, oh, it'd be easy if I just walk on water and grab the fish? I, I don't know that. That's just, that's just my imagination. But I, I do wonder if he saw this man that he had been walking with early in his career defy the laws of gravity that maybe something in him said, you know what? I want to do that too. It's not being jealous. It's being inspired. Man, I've never seen anybody do that before. I, I, w- I want to do that too. Or it could have just been an irrational thing. You know, Peter was, was an irrational guy. Just like, you know what? Didn't think too deep of it. If this really is you, call me out here. So he decided to talk to Jesus, even though he was skeptical. And then he also decided to try Jesus, even though he was terrified. There's a few people out there, family, friends, that don't know why you serve him. But if they talk and even try, they'd experience the same things that you guys experience. So that's the first, first step, being Jesus focused. Talk, try him. Next verse reads, and he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on water and came towards Jesus. Second step. These steps aren't, they're not deep at all. Second step in being Jesus focused is listening for the Lord. So I laugh because I definitely think that we have choices in life, right? But there are certain things, like maybe walking on water, you'd want to probably wait till, till the Lord said, come. Right? So Peter wasn't like, oh, this is cool. Let me just jump out there and, and go. Because a part of him, he was still afraid. But he had sense enough to say, you know what? The weather is crazy out here. The water is about to tip over this boat. Lord, if that is you, just, just tell me to come. And so he waited. He listened for the Lord before he moved. And then he, the word of the Lord says that he came. So Jesus also didn't give him any instructions. He didn't tell him what was going to potentially happen when he got on the water, right? He wasn't like, oh, it's going to get crazy. You're going to get scared. You're going to fall, then I'm going to save you, right? That'd be too easy because then we know, oh, my goodness, no matter what happens, God's going to save us. But that's not, that's not what happened. He got little instructions and chose and made up in his mind to listen and then obey. So that's 2.B of being Jesus focused. Obey him. Simple. No instructions. It's hard. Let me take that back. It's not always easy to obey the Lord. But Peter was so focused, I think, for one moment that he might have didn't pay attention to the winds. And he was just waiting for Jesus to say, come on out here. Now, what was interesting is we've already talked about this. It hadn't been a peaceful night. The storms were still doing what the storms were going to do. Peter didn't walk on still waters like the psalmist says in 23. Matter of fact, the waters were were pretty rowdy and raging. But in the midst of the storm, what my grandma would say is, geez, Peter had sense enough to know that being with Jesus in the middle of the storm was the best place to be. I don't know what storms um, you all may have experienced before Insulik, violent Insulik. But I think this, this might be a really great time to be closer with the Lord that, than you've ever been in your life. There's some good distractions at home, family, maybe school, stuff like that. But being in the presence of the Lord when things around us, you know, you know where we are, right? Physically located. So spiritual warfare going around. Maybe spending some time with the Lord is, is what he's called us to do in this time. So step two. Jesus focused, listening for the Lord and obeying the Lord. Scripture goes on to say that he saw the wind and became afraid. He began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. 
One version actually says that he saw the strength of the Lord and, and begat, became frightened. Now, we don't know how long Peter actually walked on water. It never tells us. But he does begin to sink. And I'm wondering if maybe poor Peter probably perceived this, this potential power of the wind. And instead of realizing the power of Jesus Christ, this is what got him distracted. Right? So I said, you know, what mighty distractions? Maybe your child is acting up and you're here and you can't get your hands on them. And so the perception is you have poor parenting skill. No, they're a blessing, right? Children are a blessing from the Lord. Uh, maybe that promotion didn't come through. You studied. You really tried your hardest. But guess what? When COVID happened, we still had an income. We still had a job. Some of our loved ones didn't. So we had to tarry on their behalf. So all I'm saying is Peter didn't necessarily lose eyesight. He didn't go blind, right, while he was on the water. He wasn't even disobedient. He didn't get out there and say, oh, no, never mind. I'm going to go back to the... Literally, he got distracted. Distractions can be deadly. I am, we know that in our field, right? Distractions can be deadly. But we literally serve a God that even though we get distracted, he's, he's still right there. And so Peter, we give him a hard time for losing focus. I, you know, I, I preach this. Like, he lost focus. He really didn't trust Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. He did, he did lose focus, right? I'm going to go with my grandma again. She said, but Peter had sense enough to know that before he drowned, he needed to depend on the Lord. It said immediately. It don't, no, let me take a step back. He said, beginning to drown, right? So we don't know if it's just the feet going out. We don't know if his head is above the water. It just says beginning to drown. He crawls out. Lord, save me. Something simple. It wasn't this eloquent prayer, prayer. Lord, I know that you're magnificent and you're wonderful. You can save me if you do it. You've done it again. No, he simply said, Lord, save me. And guess what Jesus did? Y'all read the scripture. He put his hand out and he held him up. Man, that's scary though. All those are the breaking point of losing your life. So here's my imagination again, right? So I literally thought, okay. Peter was a fisherman before he ever became fisher of men. So storms were probably a hazardous part of his job, right? Pretty sure that he never, he's never been out fishing and then the storm never came. I'm, again, this is my imagination. Again, scripture never said it, but I'm just, I'm using my imagination. So let's just say he was out there fishing because his livelihood depended on it. And the storms came, and maybe the boat tilted over a little bit. I could just imagine that he would at least attempt to swim. He would at least get on. Like, I, I'm just super, I don't know about you guys. I don't think I would be a fisherman if I didn't know how to swim. So I don't know how to swim, so I don't go to the pool. I'm going to learn while I'm here. That's a, that's a caveat. But I don't think I'd be doing that job if I didn't know how to swim, or at least. So I think he would attempt it to swim. But y'all, he didn't. That's the profound part. Peter did not try. He did not depend on his own strength. He depended on the Lord. He didn't depend on himself to survive. He recognized that he was drowning and depended on the Lord. That's, that's the third, third point of being Jesus focused, right? We all have skill sets. We all have talents, but I guarantee you I wouldn't be up here if I, if it was on my speaking skills. I wouldn't be an instrument as a chaplain if it was something that I thought of. I have to depend on the Lord every single day to do what I do. And I think that as he was drowning, he recognized that he had to be dependent on, on the Lord. So, I just started going off on that one right there. That's, that, was, that was one of my favorite points. I was like, yes, God, we're going to talk about depending on you. All right, so now that we know what it takes to be Jesus-focused, talking and trying Jesus, right, listening and obeying the Lord, depending on him when you're drowning, why does this matter? It's twofold. 
Peter got to walk on water. Matter of fact, the only man in history outside of Jesus that walked on water. But I think verse 32 and 33 really explains why this was important. So when Jesus saved Peter, the wind did not stop. It stopped when they got into the boat. Now this implies that Jesus actually walked with Peter in the storm to this safe place, to the boat. And when they made it to the boat, the others worshiped him. And they said, you are certainly God's son. And I've mentioned earlier, this wasn't the first time that the disciples and, the de- and Jesus had been on a boat on the seas and it gotten crazy. Matter of fact, earlier, I don't think that they, they really grasped who they were with because the word of the Lord back in Matthew 8 ends up saying, once he calmed the seas, that they were in awe of him and said, man, what kind of man is this that the wind and the seas obey him? They were still pondering. But in this instance, after Peter almost drowned, they end up saying, you are certainly God's son. I don't, I don't think y'all really get it, right? So six chapters earlier, they questioned what he was made of or who he was. Six chapters later, chapters later the same people began to declare who he belonged to. Eric, I, I, don't, I don't know if they hear me. They begin, the people that have been walking with you, the people that have seen and witnessed what God has done in your life, those same people finally declared who Jesus was in that moment. So who's watching, who's watching you all? Right? Who, when you're Jesus-focused, it's not just about making the next rank. It's not just about having a lot of money. It's about the people that are going to come to know Jesus Christ because of your Jesus focus, right? And it won't, it won't be easy. So yes, being, being Jesus focused might give somebody a strength because they were in a boat, right? It took Peter to get out of the boat. So being Jesus, Jesus focused might give somebody the strength to walk out of an abusive relationship. Yet being Jesus focused can also empower somebody to continue to fight for their marriage. Oh, distance, listen, distance. I'm not married, but I can imagine distance is, is a strain, a strain on, on a relationship. Amen, huh? <laughs> Being Jesus focused could potentially allow you to accomplish something that nobody in your family dreamed of, thought of, wanted to do, and definitely didn't think that you could do it. My mother will say all the time, I cannot believe I got a daughter that is preaching the word of God. I said, woman, I can't believe it either. (laughs) But being Jesus focused puts you in that type of, so you can train your mind. Oh man, you can train your mind. There's nothing against mindfulness, Meditation, matter of fact, the Lord tells us to meditate on his word day and night. But what happens when you get distracted after you train your mind? Now all you got is yourself. And I don't know about you guys. I'm pretty good at some stuff, but I don't know if I want to bet my life, this sounds crazy, on myself. A flawed individual, imperfect individual. I'm, going to, I'm willing to bet myself or my life on the person who gave up his life for me. And there are some people that might be here that doesn't know this Jesus that I'm talking about. So we don't accept Jesus in our life to accomplish things, to even get out of things. We accept Jesus in our life for eternity so that our eternity could be secure. Because through this life, there will be some ups and downs. But it will be worth it when we're worshiping the Lord in heaven. So, 
if you have never given your life to Christ, and you're like, God, man, I don't know what it looks like to, to talk to him, to try him. I bid that if you want to, we could pray right now. And he makes all things new. I'm a living example. All things made new. And let's just say, no, nah, everybody, we're all brothers and sisters in the faith today. But maybe you're having some difficulty being Jesus-focused. And you just want to pray that the Lord align your mind and, and your heart again. Hey, I'm, I'm down here for that too. I'm opening the altar. We can pray together. You can see me after the service. But Jesus is calling after you. And the question is, what you're looking at so that you can come? And if you're already there, if you start to drown, he's still going to save you. Just stay Jesus-focused. Let me ask you a question. What you looking at? What you looking at? So, if all minds and hearts are clear, y'all ready to go? Y'all talk back to me a little bit today, so I'm telling you, in the future, you don't talk back to me. We'll be, we'll be here long. All right. Well, please stand and, and let me uh, dismiss you all. Thank you, Ozzy. Dear God, Lord, we just thank you for another day to hear what you have for us. This Christian walk is not made for the weak, for the meek, but is made for people who recognize their humanness, recognize their imperfection, and understand that they need you. God, I pray for everyone here and their families back home. Cover them, protect them, allow them to see that all the chaos, all the social injustices, the illness, Lord, just the things that may take them for focusing on you, allow them to realize that you still have it in control. God, one day this all will be over and we will be worshiping at your feet. But while we're here, allow us to continue to be the light, to be the salt in this earth, so that ultimately when we lift you up, you, not us, but you will draw all men unto you. That God, as this is the first day of the week, I pray that your children have a great week. That they're able to accomplish just the little things that you have placed in their hearts to accomplish. And God, now I just ask that you bless them, that you keep them, that you watch over them, and that your face shines upon them. Lord, be gracious to them. Lord, turn your face towards them. In Jesus' holy name, we all pray. And the church says, amen.